So why don't you start off by telling me where you're from? Sure thing. Well, uh, first off, thanks for having me. Excited to be part of it. I uh, grew up in Irvine, California, actually. So I uh, moved to Irvine when I was about eight years old. Uh, my family immigrated from South Africa and uh, moved directly to Irvine because that's where all the other South Africans went. And I was there through through college. First of all, I did not realize Irvine was a hotbed for uh, South Africans. Uh, second of all, that's that's wild, man. So South Africa sounds like a, uh, a really interesting, diverse place to uh, have spent the first part of your life in. Yeah, it, it absolutely was. And the coolest part is that a lot of my family remains in South Africa. So we we had the opportunity growing up to head back there and and see this whole other world you know when you live in the u.s people don't really understand how good it is until you've seen third world countries and, and even you know developed countries that are just not there um you go back and you have this completely different mindset and just you're exposed to so many different things and and people and cultures it's it's pretty amazing you know i i hadn't i didn't travel much when i was a kid uh just for for whatever reason you know it wasn't something that my my family did a lot of especially outside of the country i mean maybe you know minus the the trip to mexico here and there and you know as an adult i've had a chance to do a lot of traveling and have been all through europe and asia and 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 experience all these different cultures and you know, I, I think it's the one you know one of the things that this country could do a better job of that other countries uh, really have part of their culture, especially if you go into like Australia and you go to parts of Europe where, you know, when, when, when a kid graduates college, like there's just an expectation that you're going to spend a year or two years just traveling around the world. And that perspective yep. I think is so important in life. Yep. Yep. We've, and, uh, I, I believe we see it now. We see, um, it's just a completely different mindset, right? When you look at a lot of the other countries, when I look at my Australian friends and my British friends and South African friends, they, they are, they understand the way the world works. Whereas a lot of my friends here only understand what's expected from an American, American standpoint. And it is, um, I think it's only half the story. Elon, so. Elon Musk is South African. Is, is. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, obviously it's a big country, but, uh, Ed, did your family know his family or was there ever any connections? No, there? no, no. So, that'd be nice. That'd be a great story. Right. <laughs> um, so you, 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 uh, you grew up in Southern California primarily after after being born and, and, and raised in South Africa. Uh, you end up in Stony Brook College, right? That's Long Island, New York. Yeah, a, a long yeah. ways away from Irvine. Yep. How, yep. Tell me a little bit about that. How did uh, how did you choose Stony Brook? Sure, sure. Um, so Tony, Stony Brook chose me uh, is the real the real answer. So. Um, you know, I was doing my own recruiting. I, I came from a family. None of my parents, uh, neither of my parents went to college. Um, in fact, very few people in my family were college educated. So when it came down to, you know, grow, growing up in Irvine, it's very academic uh, focused. And I was the one driving my own ship for, for my own college career. As far as my parents were concerned, I was going to just magically find a job with no college education and no experience. Um, I don't think that they even thought about it when I, uh, I was the first person to go to college in my family or graduate college in my family. Um, it was just never a thing. So the recruiting I was doing was really through swimming. So, you know, I, I did well in high school. I was high enough ranked at CIF and, and other, uh, on the competitive side that, um, I was getting some letters for some, from some schools and I was going to be the you know, the five guy, six guy at one of the bigger schools locally. Um, or I could go to Stony Brook and get a ride. And it was uh, an email that I got from the coach there and or a letter that I got from the coach there, I should say, um, that just said we had some money for you. And, and so I went. What events did you swim? I was a sprint freestyler. So I was 5,300 free. Um, I, in punishment, I swam some 4 a.m., um, but short stuff, yeah. And um, so, you know, what is it? What does it take? Like, how good do you have to be to be able to get a scholarship to swim? Right? I, I'm I'm assuming it's it's relatively competitive. Uh, you know, it's not football. Yeah. There's you know, isn't 85 scholarships at every you know Division One school? Uh, where, where did you fit in in uh, sort of the national rankings? So, I mean, really, to swim in D1 uh, in a D1 program now, um, I don't know that I could do it. I don't know that any of the guys that I swam with could do it. 
Um, the training has changed so much. Kids are starting so much younger. Uh, but I was, uh, just to give you a sense, I was in California, was, it's probably one of the faster um, high school uh, competitions in the, in the country. And I was a top four, top five at CIF uh, D1. So I was relatively good. You know, I, I, um, I don't think I could have made the Olympic team or anything like that, but um, I, I was pretty fast. And it, it was a challenge to get recruited even at that point. So now... Um, now you almost need Olympic trial cuts to get recruited uh, in a college swim program. D2, D3, where they're not scholarshiping anybody, it's different. D1 is competitive. And the other issue is Title IX did have a, a huge impact on the ability for these smaller sports to recruit. So a lot of those scholarships went to, uh, right or wrong, right, I, I think it's right, went to uh, women. And it eliminated a lot of the opportunities for men to get scholarships that probably shouldn't have gotten them in the first place anyways. Um, we just kind of leveled the playing field. What, when your career was, was coming to an end, your swim career, uh, you were a four-year um, athlete there. Um, did you have some thoughts and some aspirations of potentially going Olympic trials and, and, and going that route, or did you kind of know it was over? I knew it was over. Yeah, I'd, I'd run my course. I, um, I didn't get faster in college. I, I um, you know, for the first time, my parents never pushed me, um, really <laughs> never pushed me at all to compete. I did it on my own. And in college, when I had, I was in a situation where I was working, I was going to school. I had to be at every workout, not I could be at every workout, um, which was a very different, very big shift, right? When you're in, in high school and your parents are giving you the choice to go to 6 a.m. workout, it's great. Now, when your coach is literally, I mean, I remember there was three times I missed work out in the morning and I had a, I had a $50 bill, uh, like a, a, a receipt essentially saying your scholarship's been reduced $50 because you missed work out today. Um, it's just a very different um, feeling. And I just, by the end of college, I was done. You know, it, I talk about this with uh, a couple of my old buddies and teammates from college and, you know, you would you would act sometimes it was just was such a drag, right? Going to practice training, you know, getting into the gym, uh, even going to class at, at times felt like a huge drag. And now, you know, we're all in our forties, middle age working. And we're just like, could you imagine if all you had to do all day long was work out, train with your buddies and then go to class and like learn really interesting facts, you know? And for some reason at that time in your life, it feels like such a drag. You don't want to do it. You feel like this whole world's out there and you want to take it on. And then you get past it and you're like, God, it was such a great time of our lives. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What's the, what's the, the phrase youth is wasted on the young, you know, it's uh, yeah, totally. Absolutely. I would, I would give nothing. Uh, I would give everything, excuse me, to be able to work out and learn. I mean, what, what's cooler than that? Did you have then? Not so much. Do you have that coach? You know, like I, I know there's uh there's still things I say in a day and day out basis. And it's just like, you know, these, they're almost like cliches, but things coaches used to say to us all the time. Like, do you have any, you know, kind of saying or anything a coach used to just always like throw at you that you just still to this day, like can't get out of your head? You know, there's uh, honestly, it was nicknames and things of that nature where depending on how my training was looking that day, you know, if I was, if I was lazy, it was walrus. If it was, you know, just different nicknames that he would give all of us if we were sucking it up. Um, I would say that's, that's number one. And then, the, you know, my first real job is that's where I have probably more takeaways where my boss was just very, um, I had never, obviously never had a real job before, but to this day, I've never worked with anybody like my first boss who just understood the, the numbers and understood the way things work. So, so, so did you move back home right after you graduated? Yeah, I was actually my senior year. I was flying back, um, doing interviews for a job here. And the day I graduated, I jumped in the car. And in fact, the actual day I graduated, I jumped in the car and drove back. And did you know what you wanted to do at that point? Like, had you kind of had a prep, you know, a plan for, for your career? No, no, I, uh, I, no, not even close. I mean, I, I was a psychology major. You know, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I've been really fortunate where I often ask myself, you know, 
am I lucky? Do they just fall? Do things fall in my lap, or am I just an opportunist and I just I jump when I can when I can jump? Um, but no, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I took a job. Again, I interviewed during my senior year. I started. I think two weeks after I graduation, I started the job. It wasn't a job that I thought I'd be in forever. Um, I ended up being there for about almost ten years um, before I started my companies. And and you got your MBA uh, kind of during that period of time, right? You went uh, went to Pepperdine, got an MBA there, mm-hmm. uh, really good business school. Um, you know, that's something I get asked a lot, you know, having, having done the same, gone back, uh, you know, got an MBA. It's a, it's a huge commitment, uh, time commitment, um, cost, et cetera. And, you know, frequently asked, is it worth it? And, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. You know, what your, what your decision process was before you're deciding to go through that program. And then, you know, now in retrospect, you know, was it worth it? Would you recommend it to other people? So, so it's, um, I've got two answers for you. Um, me being in, in quote unquote, the corporate world and working for someone else, uh, my boss came to me and said, I'm a couple of years from retirement. I want you to take my job. Um, we will pay for your MBA because the psychology degree is just not going to cut it. Um, so the, he gave me no pressure, but he gave me an opportunity to go and get it done. Um, now, the challenge for me as a psychology major getting into a, a, any decent MBA program, uh, your psychology degree doesn't help. So I actually had to go back. Uh, I spent about a year and a half going to school at night to get uh, to get some business credits underneath my belt. Um, so I went back to Long Beach State. Um, I didn't get a degree there, but I got enough classes to qualify for a, a quote unquote minor. And then I was able to apply to Pepperdine and a few other schools and um, was it worth it? If I, I learned a lot, I learned which questions to ask. I think in a corporate setting, I think an MBA was helpful. I think it, it lent, um, it made people feel more confident in my ability to lead, um, especially when we're getting into bigger budgets and bigger numbers and more people. However, uh, you know, running my own businesses, I, I don't know that I would have done it again if I was already in the throes of my businesses and doing what I was doing. I don't think that there was anything that I learned that made me a better business owner and a better, better boss or better with numbers or anything like that. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. I, 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 you know, the, the thing that I would say, don't do it is if you're trying to get a job because of it. Um, I, you know, I mean, I guess there's people that come out, you know, young kids that end up going to, you know, Harvard or whatever it is, and they get into investment banking or they want to get into management consulting. And, and you know, that's, that's the path. Uh, but for a lot of people, you know, that, that are doing it because they think that they're going to come out and the world's going to open up to them. And just from a job perspective, I'd say that's, that's, that's a fallacy. Like don't, don't yeah. go that route. Um, right. You will build a network, right? I mean, I, I, I still to this day work with people that, you know, I've met and relationships that were developed during that process. And, and, you know, you learn the rules of the game a little bit. Uh, it's not, it's not that you can't learn it on your own. And obviously you've, you've, you know, CEO of, of multiple companies, you, you have learned it on your own, but you know, you kind of get that framework and you can understand a little bit on, all right, really, what am I looking at from a balance sheet? And if I am going to raise money, how does this work? And you know, whatever it might be. So, you know, there are some functional things that, that, that you find some value, but, uh, yeah, absolutely not a, uh, a, a ticket to anything and, and not necessary in many ways. I mean, you can self-learn and be self-taught all those types of skills. Yeah. Yeah. People, I mean, there's no question people take you more seriously when you have those three letters behind your name. And, um, you know, I think there's a level of trust that it, it, it helps build. Uh, but again, just from a pure learning standpoint, I feel like I, I've learned more from making mistakes in my business and just not doing that again, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I, I do appreciate it. I, I, I know how to speak to people that I might not have known how to speak to before. I know there's a, I have a book of questions that I now ask that I probably would not have learned to ask until too late. Um, so I'm glad I did it. But again, if, you're right. If it's because I want, I want to go find a new job and you think it's going to so, solve all the problems, I don't think it's the way to go. You're essentially the CEO of two companies. Um which is, which is an impressive task. One company is uh, very much established. I'd, I'd love maybe you just take a second kind of to help people understand sort of the size and scope of, 
your first company. And then, you know, obviously I want to dive a little bit into the second one as well. Cool. Cool. Uh, yeah. So in 2011, I founded Premier Aquatics, which is um, essentially pool management, learn to swim lifeguard. So it's a water safety company is what we call it. Um, we staff roughly 550 to 600 lifeguards throughout the West coast of the U S um, we have about a hundred locations, um, where we provide lifeguards and we run about, uh, depending on the time of year, anywhere from two to 13, uh, learn to swim programs, um, where we see thousands upon thousands of kids a week through our, our doors. Um, we also own um, a couple of privately owned swim schools. So we, we've been purchasing land, developing that land in swim schools and building indoor learn to swim facilities where uh, it's another team, but a lot of redundancy within the administrative side of things. Um, so that's exciting. It's been going in the right direction. It's, it's, um, it's been growing year over year at a really um, sometimes scary clip. Um, and yeah, I, I'm I'm really happy with the way that it's gone and the team that we've built and where where I see it going in the future. And then uh, obviously you've alluded to the other companies. So we built a software to run Premier Aquatics to run the the, the actual team. It's an employee engagement platform, which basically drives performance and employee satisfaction within the company. And and we basically over the course of four years or so. We saw it really work. We saw it really make a big difference in our in our bottom line. The the, the turnover costs got cut in half. Um, staff were staying longer. They were happier. They were more engaged. So essentially, um, with a couple of the guys from my MBA program, I was talked into redeveloping it into a multi tenant system. So we we're finishing a, a million dollar raise as we speak. We're about done with it. Um, we launched the app in the app store and Google play store this week, and it's, uh, we're off to the races with a whole new company. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really very, very cool. Um, you know, uh, you know, having a chance to, to get to know you over these years, you, you know, you, you, you are able to build this first company up to, you know, the size it, it's at, I know you've had to take a lot of, uh, chances along the way. I know you've bet on yourself several times along the way. Um, and you have a really successful, thriving business. Um, and, and, and what I love is that you saw another opportunity that existed uh, and you were you know, willing to take a shot on that, um, found this new company. And I mean, and, and you're not playing around like you're, you're, you know, you're going out there, you're talking to VCs. You, you, like you said, you said you're just about to close a million dollars of funding. You, you have an engineering team. And you know, looking to build and scale a, a a true SaaS company, you know, while also running this other business that you you founded and have grown to you know significant or relatively significant scale. Yeah, it's it's uh it's interesting and it's a it's a weird dilemma for me because, you know, for ten eleven years I've been uh, personal sacrifices is, is to say to say it lightly. Um, I think my kids have have sacrificed. I think my wife have sacrificed. I think I know I have sacrificed. Um, I've asked employees to sacrifice to build this business, and we're finally at a point where uh, we get to reap the benefits, and we're actually getting weekends off, and we're actually you know making the right pay, and we're everyone's kind of living it. And then when this one team opportunity um, came into my head, I just couldn't get it out of my head, and it's the you know it's. I joke, it's like the difference between a CEO and an entrepreneur. I'm probably a bad CEO, but I'm a great entrepreneur and I get really excited. And it, it was it was the next challenge and the next opportunity. And to some degrees, you know, my wife says you should maybe slow down and enjoy what you built. Um, but the way I do that is by building something else. And it's I'm super excited about it. So how do you manage that then? You know, I mean, you know, what you just described is actually fairly common. There's a lot of serial entrepreneurs that are amazing at taking an idea from conception and getting to initial traction. And then, you know, they're not always the best operators. Now I, I know you, and I, I think you're being humble and I think you're actually a, a, an excellent operator and, and what you've been able to do in, in, you know, your main business. But as you do look at starting to have multiple lines, there's only one of you. How how do you start to you know spread it out a little bit and um, you know to be able to bring on other people to take on responsibility from you? 
Yeah, I mean, it's probably been my biggest challenge. I'm fortunate enough to have my main operations director for Premier Aquatics um, is overseeing a lot of what goes on at and daily. Um, I will say my calendar is my best friend. I schedule uh, everything out from from busy work time to reading time to uh, everyone kind of knows when they're going to get me and it forces them to be a little bit more prepared. Um, but I'm, we're working a lot of hours, to be quite honest. I mean, it's our, our dev calls start at 6, 6.30 in the morning every day. And, you know, where we've got emails coming throughout the day and just being really deliberate with my time is the number one thing, right? Um, I, I try not to, unless it's an emergency, I try not to let anything derail me from what my day is supposed to look like. That's the only way to get it all done, right? And then it's the matter of of just open, honest communication and just making sure you empower your people to make decisions that I probably would not have allowed in the beginning. I was, to say the least, a micromanager. I was, I was at every program. I was watching every swim meet. I was watching every training. I was, and at some point, you just have to systemize and trust that you've got the right people. If you don't find the right people, right? Um, but yeah, that's. That's how I do it. I really try to be very deliberate with my time and my my energy. A question that I always like to ask, you know, and and one of the reasons I I, I started this podcast is because, uh, well, number one, I, I I love talking to you know successful entrepreneurs and people that are just doing well in business, and I also love sports and athletics. And I know in my personal life, both as an entrepreneur as an ex athlete, so much of so much of my like forging, I think occurred in college and through sports and through, you know, working with teammates and sort of a competitive drive and work ethic and just amazing coaches and people that, you know, helped shape who I was. And, you know, I like to think that I've taken that forward professionally. So the question I always ask, and I'm you know, curious, and it, in your case is this kind of drive that you've demonstrated throughout your career, that you've, you've just described to me that, that, you know, this work ethic, is that something that you've always had and is one of the reasons why you were successful as an athlete or is, you know, your just competitiveness in nature and going and being an athlete and competing at the level that you've competed really helped kind of build this drive and work ethic that you've now applied to business? Um, it's, it's a combo, but I think it comes down to, I am, I am really driven. I am. I, I wake up in the morning excited for the day. And I remember at 15 years old, I took my first coaching job and I rode my bike to the racket club near my house and coached master swimming in the morning and um, where all the other 15 year olds on their mornings, they weren't swimming, were sleeping. Um, I've always been um, matured in that, in that respect, immature in a lot of other respects, but I've always wanted to do more and I've wanted to stay busy and I'm not, um, I, I love sitting on the beach as well, but I, I want to stay, stay active. And I think that's why I ended up where I ended up, right? College with college swimming, with, with my career, with everything else. I've just been um, excited to take on more and it's never been why not. It's been, let's go for it. Right. Um, I've always wanted to take on the new challenges and, and push myself as hard as I can. I think part of that comes from your, you know, your parents' upbringing, you know, you being born in South Africa, you know, being, you know, obviously coming to this country, not necessarily educated. You said you're the first person in your, your, your family to get a college degree. I'm assuming there's a grittiness that probably existed in your family and definitely coming up in an area like South Africa. Do you, do you think that that had something to do with this? No question. I mean, my dad was, uh, um, and he can kill me for saying this later, but. I don't know that he was the smartest business person. You know, he's an entrepreneur as well. He owns his own business. But um, I remember it's always been the norm. Even going on family vacations, we were stopping at three different suppliers on the way. And we were, it was just kind of part of the thing, right? It said, yeah, we're leaving at 5 a.m. so we can get to L.A. by this time. So we can do these three things to then go up north and go. So I think it's always been just a natural, normal thing for me. Um, but I also... I find enjoyment in it, in it. I really, I, I don't have, um, you know, I've got my group of friends and I'm social and I love it, but really my fun to me is problem solving like that. That is exciting to me. That's fun to me. Um, 
And I, I think I, I got that from my dad. I love that hustle. I love that hustle. We, we got a lot in common just in regards to, um, I was the first person in my family to go to college as well. And my dad is an entrepreneur and, uh, you know, I, I think I, I kind of grew up with a little bit of that hustle, but you know, at the end of the day, I just love to create things, right? I just, it, it's really yeah. fun to build things and, and, and to sort of stand back and like, look at this thing that you put together and you built. Um, one of the things I know you're a family man. Uh, one of the things I talk about with my wife, I have two daughters is how do you, you know, you want them to grow up with a little bit of that grit too. Right. Because I think your background, you're describing it very well. Like, you know, you, there, there, there's a little bit of a grind there. Your dad was a hustler and maybe things weren't always the easiest. And, um, you know, you kind of got to see things happen. And, and I know your parent, your, 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 uh, your children are going to see your work ethic, but I'm assuming they're growing up in a life that things are a lot easier than maybe they were for you. <laughs> it's like, how do you make sure that they have that little chip on their shoulder? So they're willing to hustle and they're willing to work hard and, and sort of earn the things that they want in life. You know, uh, for, for one thing, my kids are uh, spoiled rotten <laughs> and, and they are, they're, they're smart kids. They're nice kids, which is really the important thing to me. Um, and I've been thinking about this a lot recently and, and um, because I wasn't around, I, I legitimately, I tried my best to be there um, at the important things, but I wasn't around. My wife raised them on her own. I, I was up until two years ago or three years ago. Um, so now that I'm involved with their day to day, um, I'm trying really hard to support their, their loves. I'm mean, excuse me, I'm finding it um, necessary to support their love. So for instance, my son out of nowhere wants to throw a football and I come home, I'm tired. I want to have dinner and, and call it a day. He wants to throw a football. I walked in yesterday and I said, hey, you want to throw the football? And he jumped up and, you know, I was able to support him in that. I, I went and I, we were working on stroke work in the pool the other day because he had, you know, he's a swimmer as well. And you know, we work with his soccer skills and we support all the things that he loves. And I try to do the same for my daughters as well, um, where if you allow them to invest, because it really it's hard for us to invest in what they want to invest in. But if you if we can just do a better job of that, like really listening to what they want to do and what they what they're excited about, and supporting that, I think it's going to build on its own. I mean, they ha they have to um, they have to learn it through osmosis to some degree. But if we can get behind them and really support the way they, you know, it's like softball or anything else, right? They want to keep going at it. Let's keep going at it. You know, if they want to try something new, great. But let's put it all into that. Let's write some goals down. Let's decide what we're going to do with this for the next three months. And let's stick to those goals and see if you want to, you know, reassign these goals next time or not. There's so, there, there's so many life lessons that can, you know, be, be learned, at, you know, especially in, in, in sports in general. Uh, but, you know, I, it, it's interesting as you were saying that. Uh, I, I remember as a kid, you know, my dad would come home from a long day at work and I'd be like, dad, let's go throw, let's go play catch. Let's do whatever. And it was always like, ah, oh, oh, I'm tired. And uh, all right, let's go. And you, know, you throw and you throw and you throw. And, and you're thinking to yourself like, why, you know, all I want to do is play catch. Like, why wouldn't you want to play catch? And now you're an adult. You come home after like, you know, whatever, a 12 hour day and a million things on your mind. And one of your you know, kids want to go out and play catch. And you do have that moment of like, I just want to sit on the couch so bad right now and do nothing, but, but yep. you got to show up, right? Like it's just so important for your, for your, 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 your kids and the relationship you're building for you to just be like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go out and do this. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's really, they have energy. It's going to be directed in one direction or another. Right. So is it, is it social media and you know, whatever, or is it physical activities and goal driven performance and things of that nature? So, um, they're going to go whether you like it or not, right? They've, they've got, they need an outlet, whatever that outlet is. So um, I think it's really important to support the outlet that they get excited about that obviously is a healthy one. Yep. All right. So let's, uh, let's, let's dive into some, some more specific questions, some, some more fun questions. Um, so one, one of the questions I always like to ask is uh, if you could go back and give your 18 year old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Wow, a lot of advice there, but um, I would say 
fiscal responsibility. You know, I, I was fortunate enough, even out of college, you know, in college and out of college to, to do okay. Just because I was grinding, I was you know, swimming at night and bouncing or bartending or serving or whatever I was doing in college. Um, I would say just being smarter about money in general um, to, to be able to afford to do the things you want to do, whether it's trips or building a new business. Um, so that's one. And then um, probably shut up and listen. You know, as an 18 year old, we think we know everything. And, you know, we know a lot and there's no question about it, but um, there's a lot of really smart people who are, you may not like the entire message, but there are bits and pieces that you can glean from everybody and just shut up and listen. Yeah, another one is don't, don't try to jump the line too fast. Right. I mean, I know myself, it was, you know, it was like early in my career. I, I, I was like, I, I should be the, you know, the, I should be the CEO of this company. Right? You know, like, and you're just like, Hey, just relax, pay your dues. Like, lo, lo, yeah. you know, learn a little bit more before you're so anxious to take off, take over the world. I mean, you don't ever want to crush that in somebody. I mean, I think that's where entrepreneurship comes from, but there are people in life that, you know, they'll, they'll be with the company for six months and they're wondering why they haven't really got promoted to, to VP. Uh, we, we get the question all the time. So, <laughs> um, you know, as we look back on your, your professional career, you know, what's, what's that one failure that that's, stands out. And I mean, obviously you've learned from it and you're, you're doing great, but what, what's that, that one big mistake that you're like, oh, gosh, I wish I could have that one back. Um, I mean, honestly, it was, it was a new program. It was, uh, you know, when I started the business, it was uh, very seasonal, right? We were summer lifeguards, summer swim programs. We didn't have anything year round. And I, with, without doing any research, without any preparation, without any, pr any, anything, I launched a uh, essentially like an after school program to we had an office space, we had staff, we had, you know, and I did nothing to look at competitors. I did nothing to look at programming. I did nothing to look at staffing budgets. I really just said to hell with it. Let's go. Um, and it cost me quite a bit of money um, in, in a very short amount of time. It cost me a lot of money. Um, and it took me a couple of years to dig out of that. It was right in the beginning when I started the business, it was, I just got too excited too quickly and I, I shouldn't have been there. When you hire, uh, what is the most important trait or strength you look for, uh, in, in somebody that comes on board to your team? Um, willingness to take feedback and just culture fit for my, for my team. Um, really are they someone who's going to, if it's if it's the wrong person, we can generally tell right away. It's me, 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 me versus, you know, we, 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 we. And we look for the we's, right? We look for people who, who want to be part of something bigger, not just solely focused on building what they have to do. You know, how can I be part of the bigger thing? Who has been the most influential mentor in your life? Why? Um and I'll joke and say it pains me to say it, but it doesn't really. But my my first boss, Dan Bernstein, um, in the job that I, my first job out of college, and again, I was there for almost 10 years, I learned, I think I run my business the way I do because of him. Um, he was very deliberate, um, very calculating, just everything was on purpose. And, and a lot of it was, you know, this whole perception is everything. Peace came from him, where we are very big on, I know what you think you were doing, but what does it look like you were doing, right? And that all came from him from the beginning. I remember um, looking at the paint, uh, you know, the, the building that we worked in was a big building that the, the organization owned. And the the budget for paint every year stands out in my mind as just being the most absurd number. And I couldn't figure out what the hell he was, how, how could we spend this every year? Well, he would start at the front of the building and paint the entire building every year because it had to look clean and had to look inviting and had to look. And I never understood that, right? As an 18 year old, or excuse me, a 21 year old at that point, you know, what the hell, why, why are we spending what we're spending on paint? Um, but then you realize that um, just the, it just changed the feeling of the facility and the building and the people in it, it made them feel prideful about it. Um, so, yeah, I'll cut it quickly there on that one. <laughs> How do you continue to self-educate? How do you stay on top of things? 
so I'm part of uh, Entrepreneurs Organization, EO. Um, I do a lot of learning through our EO chapter and, and uh, you know, national learning and, and so on. Uh, Blinkist is my best friend. Um, so, you know, my 15 to 25 minute books on audio where I can be in the car driving from site to site or wherever I'm going and fit in some learning there as well. Um, but I would say number one is just my my four mates, my, my fellow entrepreneurs in my EO group where I can go to them and not sugarcoat anything, give the true story and get feedback on their experiences that relate. I, I've been thinking about Blinkist. You, you're, a, you're a fan. I'm a fan. Yeah. It, yeah. I'm a fan. You know, I, I used to read so much more, you know, business related material. And, you know, now it's like, I, I typically have time to read at the end of the day before I go to bed. But if I read business books before I go to bed, my mind will be racing all night long. So I'll typically read fiction. Yep. So, you know, then you get so busy during the day, you find that you have a hard time actually getting through you know, business books. So I've, I've thought about Blinkist. What I, what I've done is I'll now like kind of where I drink my morning coffee out on our patio, I'll have a book out there. And that I'm reading, and as I'm drinking my coffee, I'll sit down and I'll spend 30 minutes or so reading in the morning. It's the only way I could get into that routine. But uh, I'm, I might have to subscribe to the Blinkist. It, it's uh, it's been a huge change for me, you know, because I can get in two or three, you know, and if I want to dig in deeper and read the book after I I go through the the blinks, then great, I can do that. And I've done that a couple times, but generally speaking, you know, it's a really good summary of the takeaways of the book and. Go from there. So to all those budding entrepreneurs out there uh, that, that might be listening to this, if you were going to give them, you know, a, a couple points of wisdom, you know, before they, they start their own entrepreneurial uh, journey, what would it be? Um, one, peer advisory groups. Um, I didn't do it until later in my career, and I regret that I didn't do it until later in my career. It was the single... Um, largest impact on what I've done. And that, you know, before EO, I was in another group before that. And I remember going to my first meeting, which I didn't even know what the hell I was getting into at that point. And I walked out of there and I called my wife. I said, I just can't believe what just happened. You know, the, the troubles people are sharing about the issues they're having, you know, we're all having the same issues and we figured some cool stuff out. So I would say peer advisory for sure. And then flushing out your ideas. Really, it's their it's too easy to piss away a lot of money and a lot of effort on something that has no legs. Um, if you believe in it, go for it, but you've got to do some homework, right? You can't just be throwing darts. It's, you know, at the end of the day, like we, we're only as strong as our name and the people that trust us. So you've got to get it right. And you've got to be deliberate about how you spend your time. That's right. And, you know, in the second you take outside capital, especially that, that responsibility just even goes up higher, right? There's one thing to, to lose your own money. Um, you know, the second you, you sort of have that fiduciary responsibility to somebody else's money who took a bet on you, right? They're taking a chance on you. They're betting on the horse. Yeah. They like the idea. They like, they, you know, they like some different directions, but you know, when you invest in an early stage company is uh, you know, pre-seed or an angel investor, like you're betting on the founding team and that responsibility, the second you take that first dollar, it, uh, it's hard not to wear it. It's a, it's a whole different level of pressure that I've never experienced because I've never had um, investors. I've bootstrapped everything from the beginning. Um, and I, you know, the $100,000 is a big deal, but then you get into like the $300,000 from one person and an individual. And all of a sudden, everything that I'm spending money on, which again, I've never had to think about. Um, I, I have a budget. I stick to my budget. But now I go to conferences and it's it's even... You know, do I do I get this meal? Do I not get this meal? Do I buy this round? Do I not buy this round? Which was never part of my my, my thought process. And now I really am beholden to ten investors that I I have to make the money. That's my goal in life. Absolutely. Well, look, man, I wish you all the luck in the world. I've I've loved to to watch the journey and and watch you you know you kind of grow business number one and and get that to where you've gotten it to. And I've been very impressed by your, you know, ability to take managed risk, uh, and and just bust your butt through that risk and and, and obviously get your success. And then you know obviously coming from a SaaS background myself, I, lo I love I, I love what you guys are doing with uh, with one team and um, 
I, I think it's awesome, man. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Cool, brother. Well, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Awesome.